about dairy. Now, the World Health Organization has come out and said that dairy is safe. At the same time, they say you shouldn't eat any tissues from an infected animal, including milk. And the reason they're kind of waffling on that issue is we really don't know. We don't have good studies to, um, to really investigate this, which is a crime in itself since this has been around for decades. You'd think we'd have better research by now. There was this one concerning study, this case report in the early 90s, of this tragic case published in the New England Journal of Medicine of this Japanese woman who was pregnant and died of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And her colostrum, her first milk, was found infectious in mice. Okay, well does that mean that cow's milk is infectious to people? Who knows? I mean, but that's all, that's kind of all the information we have. So at least, is it possible? Perhaps. I mean, theoretically, that it could be at least in that milk. Um, but again, we only have that one kind of case report, that one study. So I would put, if there's a hierarchy of risk where, you know, where the highly processed meats is at top with like fast food taco fillings and pizza toppings and ground beef and beef jerky and really kind of the cheapest cuts of meat, um, that's the highest risk along with obviously fried beef brains. Um, and then kind of lower down the risk is beef on the bone, which is like T-bone steak. That, that T is actually a vertebrae. It actually has a disc of spinal cord. It has these big nerve roots coming out of it. Um, and then lower down on the risk is boneless cuts of meat, where there's just the muscle tissue itself, peripheral nerve and blood, all of which perhaps could be infectious, and kind of on down the risk. And so I would put dairy below that. A, a theoretical risk, you certainly can't guarantee its safety, especially when we don't even know how prevalent this is in the United States or throughout North America. But, so certainly not without risk, but I think low on the hierarchy of risk. What about infectivity in pigs and chickens? Pigs are susceptible to the disease. So for example, in a laboratory, you can infect a pig with, with what they call porcine spongiform encephalopathy, uh, the pig version of mad cow disease. So they are theoretically susceptible, but, for, but we actually kill pigs at about six months of age. So, um, and for example, in this study, it was like uh, the animal didn't get it to like 69 months of age. And so, you know, we just don't have older pigs hanging around, so we wouldn't expect to see it. So the U.S. government says we're not worried about feeding uh, cattle remains to pigs and feeding, grinding up the pigs, feeding back to cattle, because we haven't found any cases of mad pig disease, but we wouldn't expect to when we're killing them at six months of age. And certainly they are. Um, we do know that they are at least susceptible. The question is, could they get enough, build up enough infectivity in their bodies before they're killed at six months to be infectious, to be a threat to people? And we don't know. We don't know what the infective dose is for people in the first place, and we don't know how infectious these animals would be. Same question with, with poultry, with chickens and turkeys. They're slaughtered after literally just weeks of age, like six weeks of age, um, and again, we wouldn't expect to find any cases, not that we'd actually pick one up anyway. I mean, they don't even walk, right? So you can't see their kind of unsteady gait, but, um, which is a problem with the pigs too. Um, so again, certainly there's a theoretical risk. I mean, basically you eat anything that ever had a, a brain and you're theoretically at risk for contracting these, these types of diseases, you know? There's no such thing as mad broccoli disease though, even if it's a head of broccoli, still, okay, you know. But, you know, beyond that, we just don't know because we just haven't had enough time. And that's the problem with these diseases. There's so many unknowns. We didn't even discover this pathogen until 82 or something. I mean, so, so we're still early, in the early stages, which means, you know, what can we do except follow the precautionary principle, right? Take conc even if the risk isn't proven, we need to take concrete, practical measures to prevent these prions from entering the food supply. Uh, so the question was, is there independent research? Can we trust, for example, what comes out of agricultural colleges? And there are a number of excellent colleges. Um, you know, it depends. In my own experience, it depends on where the researchers themselves are getting funds from. So not necessarily the institutions, but the research body themselves, whether the principal investigators are basically in the pocket of these uh, producers. And so there are people doing wonderfully independent work, um, but they tend not to be funded, surprise, surprise, by you know the North Dakota Beef Producers Association or something. And so it's important, regardless of where you get a source from, is to, you know, you go to the primary um, 
primary source and you don't just you know believe me or anybody else and you look it up and I'd be happy to send people for example any of the articles I cite you, I have, most of them have on P, uh, PDFs that I can just email them to people um, so you can you know read the original research and make up your own mind as to the um, and make up your own mind as to the level of risk that you're willing to take. So there is good research done. For example, Prusner's lab is doing excellent work at UC San Francisco. Um, it's just a matter of who the government is listening to, and they're certainly not listening to the true experts. What happens to the brains and the spinal cords and the eyes and the intestines, the what they call specified risk materials, the parts of the cow with the highest potential for infection, where these peons or prions, excuse me, are just packed. Well, what they do in every other country with this disease is they incinerate it and they landfill it in special landfills. Right? This is toxic waste. What they do in here in this country is we feed it to pigs, pets, and poultry. Right? We continue, we don't let it be fed to cows directly, we put it in animal feed. So we feed it to the pigs and chickens, and of course feed the pigs and chickens back to the cows. The Food and Agriculture Organization two weeks ago came out with very, very stringent regulations, says that the United States, that, this shouldn't, that these specified risk materials should be destroyed, not fed to other animals, and that we in the U.S. should be testing like six, seven million cattle every year, and of course we're testing but a few thousand. So, I mean, we are not following international standards. We're not sta following standards set down by the United Nations or the World Health Organization. Um, we are, in effect, really protecting the industry more than, you know, which needs these cheap protein sources to, to maintain their profitability, they claim, or to at least to maintain the low price of meat in this country, right? It's kind of the, the high price of cheap food. Um, uh, rather than in other countries where the public came first.